All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Ben and Carrie Martin. We're at Hartley Hill and Gaston. It's May 18th, 2021. Thank you both so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, the first question to get us started is why wine? Oh, man. I, I, I had a feeling you were going to start with that. Um, so the original inspiration for this whole project, so I'm, I'm a veteran, we're veteran owned and operated. Our mission is to help veterans through agriculture. Um, the original inspiration for this whole project came from the French Foreign Legion. Uh, the Legion has a chateau in France um, that brings legionnaires back to grow grapes and make wine. They house upwards of 200 aging legionnaires there. Uh, they've had this chateau since the 50s. Um, the problem with legionnaires is that they're all foreigners that go to France to serve and when they go back home uh, They have no support. So I knew an American French foreign legionnaire and the VA didn't recognize his service so he was having a hard time adjusting to civilian life and He told me about this chateau that he was thinking about moving back to to kind of decompress mm -hmm. And so that was what kind of that was the kernel of the idea that, 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 that was back in 2008 um, it wasn't until 2012 that the idea kind of re-emerged. Um, I was working with a group of veterans aimed at, uh, we, we put together a program that was aimed at rehabilitating veterans through permaculture in particular. Um, the program showed promise that um, the tactile touch of soil is good for PTSD and TBI, and that there's probiotics in soil that can help regulate mood. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, veterans should consider agriculture, horticulture as an alternative therapy method. Um, there's also a growing need for farmers. The median age of farmers is 58 and nobody's replacing them. And veterans know hard work and attention to detail, which is required for farming. And so the two fit really well. It wasn't until uh, World War II that the Montgomery GI Bill came out that we started pushing veterans away from agriculture. Before that, land grants and land tenure, uh, land grants for your tenure uh, were, uh, were given um, as kind of a, a payment, mm -hmm. I guess you would say, or a, a thank you. And so um, soldiering and farming have been intertwined going back to the Roman legionnaires and even before that, you know. So a lot of those legionnaires, uh, the Roman legionnaires, uh, were given land grants as well. They would plant vineyards or olive orchards or dates or what have you. Um, so, yeah, soldiering and wine, soldiering and um, agriculture have been together for quite some time. So um, going back to 2012, I was with this group and the idea reemerged about veteran viticulture, the, this chateau in France. And I pitched it to them at the time. They didn't really bite on it because nobody, in, including myself, nobody had any, any experience in winemaking, grape growing. And so the idea died. And then in 2014, we went out wine tasting with um, the two guys that helped me get this started, Ryan and Paul. And in Walla Walla, we, um, doing a lot of wine tasting over a weekend. <laughs> it was actually two weekends over that year. Uh, in February, I, I kind of just told Ryan about this idea, went kind of on a whim, nothing happened. And then we went back in November to Walla Walla to do some more wine tasting. And he brought it back up to me. And he said, hey, I've been thinking about that idea, you know, um, that you told me about, and uh, why don't we try it? And I mean, we were five wineries deep that day, so every yeah. idea sounded great. <laughs> and we just were, we we're had having our a good first time. barrel tasting that day. So um, the, the veil of getting into the wine industry was kind of pulled down. Um, in particular, at Balboa Winery with Tom Glaze, the winemaker there. It was, uh, it was a very kind of oh, eye-opening experience doing mm -hmm. barrel tasting with kind of a down-to-earth blue-collar winery because it remove that veil of, I guess you might say presumptuousness or kind of, um, you know, like the, the high barrier of entry, you know, it, it was behind the scenes, just regular folk, you know, doing what they love. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed very much, m much more approachable at that point, even though we had no prior experience at all, just uh, a can do attitude, I suppose. Um, and then that, that, that December after our trip in November, we incorporated Dallas Wine Company and started started it from there. Awesome. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna back, I'm gonna back up for a minute here. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, obviously you mentioned you mentioned you're a veteran. Tell me tell me about kind of a life before wine. We'll start with you, Ben. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, growing up education and then and then going into the service. Yeah. So um, I'm from Oregon. I grew up in Forest Grove. I graduated Forest Grove High School in 2001. I um, joined the Marine Corps. 
a week before 9-11. So I'm, I, I, I say I'm a peacetime sign-up still. I like to say that. <laughs> um, I thought, you know, I'm just going to get my GI Bill and go to college and figure my life out after that. Um, then obviously everything changed after 9-11. Uh, I got out in 2006 after four years of service and immediately enrolled in the in, in a PCC. I found myself going to Pacific University after that and then ultimately the Art Institute um, where I studied web design and brand, brand management. Um, I also during that time was fortunate to have um, a small business experience through my family. They owned a retail shop at that time so I was able to kind of cut my teeth on startups, you know, and small business. And so um, I got hired out of school and um, found myself in like the agency life, the, uh, the, the marketing branding world, um, cubicle life too. And I would say admit, admittedly, I, I was good at what I, what I did, but I, it, wasn't, it wasn't for me, you know, the, the, the office culture um, just didn't jive with me, you know. I, I, and granted, I was kind of a high strung veteran and there were some things around that that you know I had to meet <laughs> civilians halfway, but um, and I, I didn't I didn't necessarily at the time you know being twenty something um, think I was ever wrong of course, uh, but yeah that kind of um, propelled me in the direction that I that we ended up with wine because um, I was looking for an alternative I was looking for a way out of the the daily grind you know the and so um, that's where we met in 2012. Um, we both applied for the same job in marketing and advertising, yep. and they didn't know who they liked more, and so they hired both of us, and that's how we met. Created two positions. Yeah, they created two positions for us. So. That's uh, pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, Kara, same question for you. Tell us about kind of your life before that, uh, growing up and, and education and, and early experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I lived half my life in Gresham and then moved to Pendleton, um, graduated from high school in 2001 as well, um, and then I went to... Um, uh, Lane Community College in Eugene, started a graphic design program there, um, took a lot of psychology classes, transferred to U of O, um, got my bachelor's in psychology and art, uh, minor in business, and then um, I went to Merrillhurst for my master's in art therapy counseling, graduated in 2008 or 9, I think it was 2009, um, couldn't find a job because of the recession, um, and still, I mean, I wanted to help people, but um, I still felt like I was missing out on that creative side. Um, so I went back to school, I went to Portland State and got a post back in graphic design, finished that first degree I had started <laughs> 10 years before. Um, and then, yeah, I graduated from there and then applied for that job that, where we met. So, yeah, the rest is history. When you were, you mentioned like helping people as a big part of kind of driving your education. Mm -hmm. what your, what, in an ideal world, what were you going to do after school? So I was planning on working with children. Um, and I, uh, when I was in college, I did some internships at like LifeWorks and a few other places um, and loved working with kids. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, I just couldn't find a job when I graduated and um, I just didn't know what else to do really at that time. You know, was, I just needed to find a job and, um, but I loved being creative and so I thought that, you know, maybe if I get the graphic design degree, I mean, I could still end up working with people in the future um, or with children in the future, but I um, just wanted to go back, finish that graphic design degree, yeah. So once you got hired to the same, the same point, at what point, uh, what, how did the relationship go from there? <laughs> um, I, mean, uh, we, I mean, we were both in committed relationships at the time, and um, we, we met, and yeah. like a month later, we were like, uh-oh. Yeah. Just working together, I mean, yeah, it was, it was just we just knew things. immediately that, you know, we just, we just knew yeah. instantly. We worked together every day. Um, he was more web design, I was more of the print design, but we had a lot of projects we worked on together. And yeah, just being together every day at work. Yeah. We just got along really well. Uh, we worked really well together. We had a lot in common. Um, yeah. Yeah. Same kind of drive and passion for life. and Same stubbornness to get Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was almost instant. Like, mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, like she said, we've ever since we met, I mean, I wouldn't say we've been together 24 seven, but almost. almost, I mean, we, we commuted in together all the time. We went work together all the time. I mean, there was a brief, brief moment where maybe for six months, she started a new job at Skanska and I was um, trying to go back to school and things like mm -hmm. that. But past that, I mean, we've, we've been together pretty much all the time. And it's great because we both have a, a design eye um, and we both can 
pitch the ideas back and forth, you know, for Dauntless, it really helped out because I, you know, I designed all the labels. She obviously approved them all. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, helped with the website. I did the website and, you know, just it, it took a, a big chunk of the cost of starting up a winery is that brand mm -hmm. image. Um, we were able to, to craft that right away. Mm -hmm. So it kind of comes with a double-edged sword, though. People look at the brand and think we're way bigger than we are. And it it is um, it's a good problem to have, I suppose. But at the same time, um, people are surprised when we tell them we only make 500 to 1,000 mm -hmm. cases. You know, it's like they think we're we're much bigger, or we come from money. I mean, this whole thing has been sweat equity the entire time. Um, we're definitely in the poverty status for the last few years, <laughs> yeah. and you know, I feel like some people in the wine industry have also said that, you know, you, you got to kind of take on that burden the first few years to get started. And mm -hmm. um, we definitely did do that. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's all been worth it for sure. So beside the, the kind of idea of the vet, veteran and vineyard work together, what, what was your, before starting Dauntless, what was your wine experience as, as, as it, mm -hmm. yeah. what, what point did wine become part of your story? Um, I mean, I grew up with Oregon Pinot, you know, I, I didn't know anything other than Oregon Pinot growing up. Um, my, when I went to church as a teenager, they served Kramer wine there for communion because they went to our church as well. And so uh, Pinot Noir was <laughs> communion and I was like, oh, this is okay, I guess this is wine, you know. And so um, that was my exposure to wine. It wasn't until I joined the Marine Corps that when I was down in California, started getting exposed to other wines and mostly at the market and everything but I was like okay you know these are some these are some other options out there then then sideways came out and my mom called me one day it's like you need to watch this movie sideways it's, you know they talk all about Oregon Pinot it's the greatest thing and so I watched <laughs> that I bought the movie and at the PX and watched it and then kind of opened my eyes to what Oregon Pinot meant but it didn't really set in you know I was like okay whatever you know at the time I was early 20s and drinking whiskey most of the time or, or Bud Light or whatever. Yeah. But um, it wasn't probably until we went wine tasting in Walla Walla that wine really kind of sunk in mm -hmm. at, at um, how important it is as a communal thing, as a societal thing. I mean, the wine has been intertwined with humanity for, I mean, since Noah. I mean, I, that might be some of the earliest rec rec recordings of like vinification and viticulture. So, um, yeah, I'd say 2014, those trips mm -hmm. to Walla Walla. Yeah. What about you, Carol? Yeah. What's your initial impression of it? <sighs> That's a great question. I mean, I loved Walla Walla, I think for me, was the first time that it really opened my eyes to good wine. Um, in college, you know, I bought a few cheap brands off the shelf at, you know, the local grocery store, really sweet white wines. Um, but when we went to Walla Walla, that that one time, the first time we went, um, it was the first time I'd had a higher quality wine and, and a big red too. I mean, we love, you know, the Grenache, Mer Mer well, Merlot, I like Merlot, but <laughs> Tempranillo, Syrah, I mean, all of those, I had never had any of that before. And um, yeah, it just opened my eyes to a whole nother world. So you mentioned the end of, tw end of 2014 was when you, when you got the, the, the idea for this. Tell me about from the moment of like, okay, we're starting this brand, we're starting this thing called Dauntless. Um, what were the steps? Take us through kind of the timeline yeah. and, and also the, the, the idea behind the name. Uh, so the original name was actually uh, Leatherneck Cellars because the three of us were all Marines. Um, and we, I put together a brand kind of concept um, and we kind of pitched it to what we might consider, at least in our lives, high, higher profile people just to kind of gauge the reaction and kind of, you know, just do some early brand or marketing to understand, you know, if it was a good name or not. And right out of the gate, we saw that nobody really realized what the name was or knew what it was, didn't relate to it. It didn't have a, like a resonate, uh, it didn't resonate with anybody. Um, some people even considered it a racial term, um, you know, given farmers and, you know, working outside all the time. So we scrapped that idea um, and went back to the drawing book and made it not so much focused on the Marine Corps, but um, focused on all veterans from all time periods, all services, um, service members actively serving too. Dauntless kind of just fit. It also fit mm -hmm. what we we're doing, which was trying to get into the wine industry with no prior experience. You know, you have to be a little crazy to try to do something like that. And um, so Dauntless was kind of an appropriate name for us at the time. And it's a really solid name. I, you know, I like it. I've always had an affinity for 
uh, the Dauntless Dive Bomber of World War II. Not saying that's where I got the name, but it's like, I, it's, it's a good, solid name, you know. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so we changed the name probably February of 2015. It was pretty quick. Um, but the first steps, you know, we, we, we started, uh, we incorporated, started doing immediate research, uh, found, uh, <laughs> discovered a Northwest Wine Company and uh, their Negotiant um, services. And so our business plan that we put together was, you know, buy Negotiant wine, get the brand rolling, get into some supermarkets, just kind of get some turnover going while we go to school um, and kind of take it from there. Um, so with that being said, um, I have, th there's a saying in the Marine Corps, or most branches actually, uh, plans only survive until first contact. And so it's like, you gotta be flexible. You ha instead of um, sticking to a plan, you have to have the commander's intent, which is to what's the goal and whatever you need to do, get there. So um, that being said, we, that September, we happened to meet um, the Jesse family um, from Jesse Estate Vineyards on the other side of this hill here in Shehalem. And they happened to be related through marriage to one of my partners, Paul, um, and his mom introduced us. And Alan said, oh, you know, I have these three acres of Vadensville. It's their first harvest. Nobody wants, you know, these young grapes. Um, they're gonna go to rot on the vine. Go and pick as much as you want. And so um, all of a sudden we went from doing negotiant wine to actually crushing without any experience. I mean, I had just started the um, if we backtrack a little bit, right when we decided to do this, mm -hmm. I enrolled at the Chemeca to Wine Studies program, um, and then I started volunteering at uh, Blooming Hill, uh, right there on the Shehalem too. So it was my time in the vineyard for um, cellar space. Uh, that's what we ne negotiated. And um, so we were able to get eight tons off the vine. Um, it was a late harvest and one of the hottest years too, because they were so young, we were able to actually watch those sugars and acids acids kind of dial in perfectly and we got the last clusters off right before the rains came so it was a really good harvest for us mm -hmm. um really lucky too you know 15 and 16 freshman and sophomore years it was uh probably the best <laughs> years to come in on oregon yeah. wine so there's a bit of a softball there so i'm appreciative <laughs> of that um but yeah we we paid blooming hill and two tons of grapes to get started to be able to use their equipment and just uh, started making wine, you know, with a little bit of guidance from Jim and Holly at Blooming Hill, and then also um, my wine instructor down at Chemeketa, Jessica Sandrock. So um, I leaned on them heavily because I really did. I didn't even understand pH really at that time. I was like, okay, it needs to be in this range, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> but so I mean, there was a lot of dumb luck to to get started, um, but also realizing the opportunities as they emerged and mm -hmm. as they presented themselves and not being scared to kind of walk through those doors you know mm -hmm. when when alan came to us and said you know you can take these grapes uh, ryan and paul were kind of like oh i don't know if we should we don't know what we're doing it could be it could be a complete you know catastrophe and failure and i was like no we got to do this <laughs> there's uh, th this doesn't happen every day you know so um the the 15 vintage in particular our first uh very raw unfiltered unfined unfiltered um, definitely younger too. It tastes, it's still tasting young. It's, 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 make, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was, that was that first year. Um, then we moved from uh, Blooming Hill late 2015, or no, I guess that would have been early 2016 maybe, mm -hmm. to a Dia wine company right behind us here um, on Highway 47. Um, and that was a pretty big leap. But, and then Dean put us in contact, or I guess told Hillary Berg about what we were trying to do and who we were. And then they, so they were like, okay, we'll, we'll get an interview for you on Oregon Wine Press. And the interviewer called me, we talked for about an hour. She was just kind of mesmerized by the story um, of veteran viticulture and the Chateau in France and everything like that. And we get a call back and say, we're gonna make you persons of the year. And we're just like, what? <laughs> like it, it was completely, we were completely taken kind of for surprise, you know? I have to admit that right out of the gate, I kind of had that imposter syndrome. Like, uh, who am I to get this? There are so many other more qualified people in the wine industry. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of put us in motion. And then all of a sudden we started getting a trickle in a foot traffic up at Adia. You know, I mean, we were just pouring out of their, their guest house out there, mm -hmm. that little shed out there. Yeah. I mean, it was a very, 
uh, garage <laughs> style uh, to get started. But um, I think people were enamored with that. You know, we weren't, we weren't, we were just... It was very of, approachable. Very approachable, you yeah. know, very, we were struggling, we were starting out. And <laughs> I think people uh, appreciated that because we were just down to earth and being, being human. And honest about it. And honest we're, about it. He wasn't yeah. trying to hide it. No, we were... Like, hey, <laughs> he told him everything. This is the first vintage. <laughs> one of the barrel. Like, it was, yeah, it was very... Um, yeah. yeah. Glad to see the bar pants. Still is, but a little more control now, I feel mm -hmm. like. <laughs> it's interesting marketing strategy. Oh, yeah. yeah marketing. There, there was no marketing strategy. It was like, um, just word of mouth yep. is what we've relied on this entire time. Mm -hmm. And... We have not spent, I mean, uh, other than promoting a few Facebook posts every now and then, I mean, we don't spend anything on marketing or advertising. We entire, uh, rely entirely on people talking about us, mm -hmm. you know, in our club. Our club is kind of our marketing. They go out yeah. and bring their friends in, so, yeah. So you mentioned that you were you, you were getting started right as you were getting started in, in your education. So tell me about that that experience of, of at Chemeketa, what you, what you were learning, how you were putting it into play, and, and kind of how that worked out in terms of, education and real life experience happening simultaneously i mean it was it was pretty perfect um i came in on the winter of 2014 early 2015. oh is, is it gonna rain i think it's street? okay uh, just sprinkling okay. just sprinkling a yep. little bit okay. oregon's it's oregon yeah, yeah it's oregon. Fine. We're all, we're uh, <laughs> but uh so we got started and it was just a perfect overlap of working in the vineyard and then working in the winery at the same time um because everything i was learning at chemeketa i could immediately apply going home to, to Blooming Hill, you know, it was like, and it was, it was kind of just really crazy how I would run into a problem in the cellar and then just coincidentally we would talk about that problem in the, in, in our classes too. So, um, Chemeketa, I would recommend to anybody that wants to get into the wine industry on the production side, growing side, to go to Chemeketa because it is much more a trade school than any of the other options around here. Um, you are, I mean, I did both degrees. I got the associates in both uh, grape growing and winemaking. So, I mean, I had the experience of growing the grapes and then harvesting and bringing them into the cellar all together. So, if you, if anybody wants to learn wine in Oregon, Chemeketa is the place to go. Um, you're actually hooking up hoses, tr racking from A to B, you know, doing cluster counts, weights, lag weights, all that stuff, you know. So, um, it's very much the kind of turnkey option if you're looking to get into the wine industry and i learned a lot i learned a significant mm -hmm. i actually found that i actually kind of liked chemistry you know i was really scared of chemistry <laughs> um and then i got into it and when i had something to actually apply it to um practical practical application i was like oh this is kind of fun you know so um yeah chemeketa is a great school um i mean they're having, you know, have to adjust with COVID and everything now with in person and not, uh, online. But I'm I'm glad I went when I did. Mm -hmm. And learning from uh, Jessica Sandrock and Jessica Cortell, both uh, phenomenal instructors. Um, I feel very fortunate to have learned from them. Um, and they they really guided me those those first few years. You know, 15, 16, and 17. Those vintages were all a direct kind of um, impression from Chemeketa. Uh, so. Um, yeah, it was, it was a good program to be mm -hmm. in. I'm, I'm really proud I actually went through that program, too. What surprised you about the process of wine, whether it, throughout the year? What, yeah. what, what were the surprises in the process for you? Um, I mean, everybody says it's, it's, it's expensive, and so that wasn't really such a shock. I would say the logistics have been kind of... Um, the most intimidating thing you know like moving three wineries in three years was um and with your entire vintage on the back of a trailer it's it, that's a little white knuckle experience yeah. you know and um, every year the vintage was larger yeah the vintages kept getting larger <laughs> and so um the logistics around just moving wine from a to b getting bottling lines or bottling trucks or getting people volunteer you know just the coordination of all the elements that go into winemaking from kind of a 30,000 foot view was actually, I would say, probably the most challenging for being so small and not really having much, well, any cash flow or anything <laughs> like that. So we had to be very creative, you know, we had to um, adapt, as they say in the Marine Corps, adapt and overcome. Um, and that's what we did. You know, there's there were so many times that 
this whole thing could have failed or should have failed, but some sort of, you know, we thought of something or a door opened and we just went through it and it got us to where we needed to go. So, um, but I would say that was the biggest surprise. I don't know. Yeah. About, I mean, you've been helping in the cellar the entire time. I, the, the winemaking aspect isn't, isn't that bad. I mean, but I don't know. I, that's, I would say that probably. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I felt I didn't go to school for winemaking or viticulture, but I learned through him as he was going through the program and have been helping him in the cellar since. But so I guess for me, I didn't have any surprises because I guess I feel like I kind of learned as you did. Yeah. Um, so I kind of knew what to expect. By the time I went to go help him, I already knew what I was in for. <laughs> Wear your car hearts yeah, and your boots. Always, you know, it's so. not clean and pretty back yeah. there. It's, you know, it's hard work and... This yeah, dirty long work, hours. long hours, a lot of long hours. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like we, those were all just kind of givens. We 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 already kind of anticipated those, mm -hmm. but yeah, um, yeah, the, just the logistics of moving wine around. Yeah, it became like I, I bought my F two fifty to tow my Jeep around, but then it like all of a sudden became a winery truck immediately. You know? <laughs> and it was like, oh, and I, yeah. I felt bad putting it through what I did, but it, uh, we needed it and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I quickly realized I needed a flatbed, very, you know, so um, the, the palletization, you know, of it, uh, inventory or dry goods was huge. Mm -hmm. So it's just all these things you don't think of until you need them, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. so, so. so I'm curious when it came when it came to uh, splitting up roles and working working together. Tell me about how that went and about kind of getting finding your footing and, and finding a way to, to, to work together happily. Between her and I, yeah. or just the partners and everything? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking well, it's kind of a transformation. Of you, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, she's my main seller hand, you know. She helps with the brand, audit the brand. You know, I do the label design. I kind of get it to where it needs to go. But um, she kind of fine-tunes it at the end of the mm -hmm. day. Um, granted, we butt heads on a lot of things because we both think we're right <laughs> all the time. Always. Um, <laughs> And so we have to kind of find that common middle ground, yeah. but um, breaking up roles, it, it, she is now like taken on the wine club and tackled that. that. That has become a very big job, I suppose now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, yeah, it's growing every day and we're at that point now where we're like, do we need to close our wine club? Because our consumption rates might not, <laughs> our inventory might not keep up with our consumption. So, um, but yeah, the inventory and then just splitting up roles in terms of like remembering what we have to do yeah you know, just having a second brain is huge mm -hmm. <laughs> i feel like for a long time after um his partners kind of stepped back he was well and even in the beginning i mean he mostly has always done all of the work on him on his own and then with just a little bit of help from the rest of us but um the last year or two he's had me helping him more in the cellar and I mean, really, because I didn't come in knowing anything, it's more of him just telling me what he needs help with, and I just kind of follow him around, and <laughs> what do you need me to do? Hold, usually, like, hose management. Yeah, I always joke about ho <laughs> hose management. It's, yeah, it's, Can you move this hose over here, and it's getting tangled with that one, so move it over here. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I mean, really, I'm more of, like, a support role for him most of the time. And then, yeah, now with, I mean, the tasting room, wine club, that stuff, that's a whole other story, but winemaking, um, I'm definitely more of his, like, a support for him with whatever he needs. As you've gotten to gotten to see the industry and gotten to know the industry, what 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 is appealed what is appealing about Oregon wine to the two of you? For me it's just how welcoming everyone is. I mean everywhere we've been, everyone has been so friendly. People are willing to talk to you about their, you know, behind the scenes side of things that you don't really expect necessarily. Um, I think you know anytime you know he's needed anything from anyone, people any question he's ever asked, people have been happy to answer. Um, and so, I mean, for me, that's, it's pretty amazing. Um, especially, you know, because we didn't have a background in wine. I didn't really know what to expect going into it when we first started going wine tasting. Um, you know, you kind of, I mean, growing up, I had this um, thought that it was more of a, you know, high class, like it's going to be you know, a little snootier maybe in a tasting room, you know, more, less approachable. But Oregon wine specifically, I mean, everyone has been super welcoming, very friendly. They love to educate you if you have questions. Um, yeah, I would yeah. say the, I mean, kind of going off what she said, the camaraderie has been pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I mean, we've both worked in a lot of different industries, um, four or five for me, and um, the Oregon wine scene is the only industry I've ever been a part of that has this communal camaraderie that um, is very unique. And you don't even really see it 
in other states as much. You know, Oregon is very special in the sense of the, you know, the original, the kind of founding fathers of Oregon wine really set the tone early on as working together. You know, we, we all rise together if we all make a premium product. And um, I think that's incredible. It, it really does um, help and kind of boost your morale when you, when you need it. You know, knowing that the industry is there, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you absolutely needed to lean on them, they would, they would be there to help. So um, that's probably been the most surprising thing. Um, I didn't know what to expect. And granted, you know, it's competitive, obviously, but um, it's more this attitude of, you know, let the wine speak for itself. The rest of us can um, help each other out, mm -hmm. this sort of thing. So, um, no, it's been, it's been incredible. And the amount of veterans, too. Like, every winery we've been at, <laughs> we've done an alternating proprietor for the, la for the entire time we've been here. Um, you know, granted, we're building our winery now, finally, but ever, ever since, you know, the beginning, Jim was an Army veteran, Dean was an Air Force veteran, uh, Laurel, uh, Laurel Ridge, Dan, or Dave, oh, I can't remember his name, is it? The, the founder of uh, Laurel Ridge. Uh, David. David, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, he was a Navy vet, uh, and so Susan was really, you know, welcoming to us when we needed a new space to go, and now the current winemaker there, uh, Lucas, he was an Air Force vet as well, you know, and so that was actually kind of surprising to see how many Just you know, by coincidence, just, just not by coincidence, intentionally. Yeah, not, not intentional or anything like that, but um, It just kind of fit into our mission of what we call like one degree of separation from a veteran You know, we want to we want to put our money where it helps veterans the most and we've been doing that just natively since we got started and so uh, the amount of veterans in the industry was pretty pretty surprising, mm -hmm. I suppose, which is great. Actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, with your with your mission, uh, what what is the, what is the sort of the the ideal outcome for the mission of, of of Dauntless? What what do you want it to be in its kind of final state? Yeah, um, I want I want it to be um, um, other than you know a premium brand making premium products. Um, a, a support platform for veterans that might be interested in grape growing or winemaking, you know, giving, opening our doors, our winery to other up and coming veteran winemakers. We already have two on our radar right now that have been working with us and giving them the opportunity to launch their own brands and their own labels. Um, you know, at some point we, we have a tasting room in Forest Grove. We might just kind of make that a hub of a collection of you know veteran uh, winemakers and that sort of thing. So um, that's on the for-profit side. We actually just inc incorporated a nonprofit as well. The board is all veterans, except uh, for me. Except, except <laughs> Carrie is. Uh, I'm always the one not. exception. <laughs> Everyone else <laughs> but me. Uh, but we got a really diverse group of uh, veterans, even including some international veterans on that board. Mm -hmm. Um, and the goal of that is to actually be the agricultural side of things and to um, give veterans that agricultural experience necessary. And ideally, it'd be more than just a vineyard, but a vineyard and a farm that could give veterans the experience necessary to go and apply to the USDA for a first-time farmer credit. And so that's really kind of the ultimate goal is to be able to employ veterans through stipends or regular employment and give them the experience necessary because you need three years with the USDA to qualify. They'll waive one year for veteran status, but you still need those two years. And so um, by giving them the, those two years experience, then they can go and apply and hopefully start up their own farms, you know, and kind of um, start working towards turning over that aging uh, farmer population um, and, you know, securing America's food supply, really, at the end of the day. That would be ideally ideal. Um, the, the wine is kind of the flagship brand of what I imagine to be more of a kind of Newman's Own concept where there's multiple brands under one kind of name mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Dauntless becomes this larger value added producer where these veterans can go back and start their own farms and have a buyer automatically ready to kind of make something out of what they're doing or growing. So. That's kind of the the pie in the sky view, um, and and we're 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 marching towards it. It's kind of on a its own trajectory now, in a life of its own. But 
it, yeah, it's, it's moving for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're just along for the ride now. Hmm. Yeah. As you, <laughs> as you look at the, the veterans you'd be helping, what are, what are some of the, I guess, what are some of the, the, the goals or the, or the issues you see facing veterans coming in to working with you? What, 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 who would you be looking for yeah. to bring into that kind of project? I suppose, you know, the, I mean, combat veterans in particular, um, they have a, a, a unique um, problems that need to be addressed that, where I feel like being around like-minded individuals um, is kind of uh, makes them feel more welcome and safe. I feel like a lot of combat vets in particular um, never felt welcomed home. Mm -hmm. which is completely different from my experience because I was in the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and when I came home it was like almost like a ticker tape parade we were heroes and all of this so we were welcomed back into the community with open arms but the war persisted on for another decade plus and so um, a lot of those veterans didn't get that and so uh, we want to be able to welcome veterans back um, and also you know a lot of vets need employment and they don't know what to do with themselves, but they know hard work and attention to detail, like I had said. But they don't want to be in that office environment, you know. <laughs> the, uh, vets can be very kind of A-type personality or direct. You know, they, they need, like, just you to talk frank with them. You know, there's no <laughs> kind of, you know, skipping around an issue. You know, they, w they, they want to address it head on. And so that doesn't necessarily jive with a lot of workplace environments. <laughs> Um, I, I experienced that firsthand, yeah. obviously. But, um, so, just having uh, bringing back that veteran community together to help with each other, um, because you know when when service members go in, they enlist or commission, they're more or less reprogrammed at an early age into a collectivist mindset, and we come from an individualistic society, and so that that is a huge kind of change. And then when we get out, or when a service member gets out, they don't deprogram you, you know? So you're kind of thrown back into the mix, into an individ individualistic society. And um, it's hard because usually, you know, the, these the service members are used to having a group together, you know, going towards one common goal or one mission. So um, fulfilling all those kind of needs, I feel like is really important. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And I, I, I hope that this continues on past us, you know, and it, can, it becomes mm -hmm. a larger thing in the long run. So let's talk about the wines a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned kind of the early on sort of seat of your pants. Uh, <laughs> uh, tell me about how your winemaking philosophy slash style has evolved from those. Yeah. And what, what kind of wines are you making today? Um, I, I like to broadly categorize it as low intervention. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean native ferments. You know, I do, I do inoculate. Um, but I feel like the most important part of the entire winemaking process is the fermentation. Um, I t pay particular attention to the fermentation and make sure that is a good, clean, smooth ferment. Um, I consider it kind of like, you know, baking, baking a cake. You know, once, once you bake the cake, it is what it is. Everything else is just frosting. You know, you're just adding on top of it. And so um, if the ferment's not good, I don't feel like the wine's going to be good. And so I'm really hands-on during the fermentation. A lot of punch downs. We don't do pump overs. We do punch downs. I like that pressing action. Um, but once, once we're pressed off and in barrel, um, just ride it out. You know, we try to maintain organic levels of sulfur. Um, don't really get into it too much unless, you know, we need to. Uh, and don't intervene unless we need to. And so um, really the wine decides what it wants to be. I feel like it's my goal as a winemaker to preserve the work that was done in the vineyard. You know, that's the hundreds of hands that have touched those vines and those grapes. And it's my goal, or I guess my responsibility to preserve that, mm -hmm. you know. It's a, winemaking, you know, the ego can get involved pretty quickly. But um, I try to remove myself from the situation and realize that you know, I'm not the only one that has touched these grapes, you know. Um, sure, the winemaker might get the attention, but um, that's not, yeah, that's not what I'm about. So mm -hmm. I really just want to make a good, clean product at the end of the day um, and remove myself from the situation. There are a lot of times in the cellar where I might smell something or I, 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 I don't necessarily know where the wine's going. And so, you know, my, my mind might get locked into 
a certain aroma. So then I have to ask my wife, Carrie, then I have to ask <laughs> other people, it's like, hey, do you smell this? Do you smell and if And nine times out of 10, or I, I guess actually 10 times out of yeah. 10, nobody, nobody. smells what I've smelled. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna intervene here, you know? So I, I like to get uh, everybody's input into that uh, because I feel like it's important. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but other than that, I mean, the wines themselves have, I mean, in 2015, yeah, it was on find unfiltered because I didn't know how to filter <laughs> and I didn't want to be adding stuff in that I didn't know what it would do. So it was very much, yeah, very raw vintage and we still drink that and it's like, it's good, but it's, uh, I love it. It's it, my favorite. It, it's a good vintage, but it's still tasty. Dumb, so, um, but 16 was a was an amazing vintage for us that sophomore I, I thought it might have a sophomore slump but um, no. you know going from blooming hill which is very kind of stripped down mom and pop to adia which had like state-of-the-art kind of glycol systems heat exchangers um, jacketed i mean i got to all of a sudden play with all these toys that the wine industry has and i feel like the 16 vintage is probably my best right now the 18s are giving it a run for its mm -hmm. money but it's um still kind of too early to tell um and then just you know discovering the best ways to make rosé you know I, I got a little aggressive on rosé in 2017 and maybe i do saunye so i i pulled off maybe a little too much juice that year so you know it's just kind of figuring it out and kind of whittling through the weeds mm -hmm. but now i've kind of got my routine down um and the wines we can take like the, with the 20s we can we can taste the 20s and be like yep this is this is on point this is where our wines are always at typically you know this is our common aroma mm -hmm. this is our common flavor mm -hmm. so um yeah the experience i've gained some experience yeah. since then and it's been very helpful for sure you mentioned your 16s and 18s being the ones you're, you're happiest with or think are the best tell me is there a is there a vintage or was there a wine so far that you are proudest of in terms of work you had to do to salvage it or to create it is what it is <laughs> yeah there's a salvage um, I call but it, he said know, proudest of well, it, what's that? <laughs> also proud of. proudest of, yeah, proudest, <laughs> of uh, the proudest of i would say my 2016 trebuchet uh, so we have two wines called trebuchet and howitzer um Trebuchet is the free run, Howitzer is the press run, so there, it's 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 a fun wine to drink together because you get to taste, you know, free run and press run, and they taste completely dis, uh, distinct from each other. Um, so the 16, the 16 Trebuchet, I would say, is my favorite. Coincidentally, the 16 Howitzer was probably the one that gave me the most grief, um, and it wasn't a matter of you know the wine or what I did to the wine. It was kind of a failure of a variable capacity lid on a thousand gallon tank, and I, I just thought it was okay, and I you know it's up way up high, so I don't get to see it, and so um, I, I had to I had to maneuver around that wine and kind of um, wrestle with it quite a bit. Um, and, when we released it people gobbled it down people loved it so it, it like personally it was i had a personal like vendetta not a vendetta but a, I, had a, yeah. I, had a, I, had a, I had a relationship with that wine so i never he was not a fan I, of that I, wine I, I i always kind of like I lamented <laughs> pouring you pouring it you know but everybody would say oh i love it i love it i love it and so uh, I never entered it into competitions or anything like that because I, I was like, you know what, you don't deserve this. <laughs> uh, it, so, the, yeah, the 16, although, yeah, it is my favorite vintage, it also um, was the, uh, provided the hardest hurdle, I guess, for me as yeah. well, you know, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Carrie, you talked about your, your work in the cellar. I'm curious, as you've, as you've learned cellar work, what, what do you enjoy about it? And what, what, have you, what have you kind of learned about the work you're doing? I feel like it's relaxing in a way. I mean, it's different from, you know, sitting at a computer all day, which is what we do a lot of the time. Um, or, you know, being in the tasting room and having to talk to people all day. I mean, I'm definitely an introvert. And so being in the cellar is great for me. It's, you know, a lot of hard work, which I enjoy. Um, but then you don't really have to talk a whole lot. I mean, we do, but, but not to a lot of other people. Um, um, but <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, I feel like it's a, it's relaxing, even though it's hard work and it's, you know, I guess it could be kind of monotonous in a way, but I mean, the entire year repeats itself, I guess, every year. So it's not monotonous throughout the year necessarily, but um, yeah, I mean, I just, it's just, for me, it's really enjoyable for the most part. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, once we get to have our own space finally, um, I think it'll be that much better, you know, being on our own schedule and that kind of thing, um, being able to do things when we want to. And It's very much uh, being an alternating proprietor, like, it's like, having a roommate in an apartment, you know? Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You like roommates, but then, you know, yeah. you just 
bump into each other and you, yeah there's some overlap on when you want to use certain things and it just it when we have to drive 30 minutes one way or the other to go and then find out you know we can't do what we wanted to do it just it kind of put a cramp on you so yeah having our own space to where we know things are set up the way we want ready to go mm -hmm. uh, that'll be huge yeah that does lead me into my next question. So we're sitting here on Hartley Hill. Yes, that's what we're calling it. So tell us about all of it, I guess. Tell us about, first of all, <laughs> wh wh why you chose the site and yeah. then kind of what your plans are for um, it. So we've actually, we, we watched this site for probably three or four years. Um, it started really high when we first looked at it. Uh, we, we bought it with some already some infrastructure in place. There was a, the road kind of put in. Um, there was a cement pad now, which we have torn out. There's this pool barn over here. Um, all of this, what we're sitting on, was actually not here. This is all from the cutout from back there. Um, but we really like this site primarily because, well, one, the view is incredible. Um, and also, it's right inside the Shehala mountain range, which is the, primarily the fruit that we have been sourcing the entire time. So we're familiar with the kind of terroir of the, the region. Um, South-facing slope. South-facing slope. I mean, the soil profile is almost perfect. A lot of basalt, um, volcanic. Uh, has some sedimentary layers in there too, um, and some some of that wind-blown lust. I mean, it has all the things that is Shehalem. So um, I'm I'm really excited about it. In particular, uh, planting some Vadensville. I've I've always been really a, a big fan of Vadensville, and I think the profile that we've kind of um, on, on, so our no man's land label is 100% Vadensville, and so I'm, I'm really excited to see the differences of you know what I can make when I have my hand in the entire process, you know, growing the grapes and then also making the wine. But um, a lot of reasons we chose this site. It had some like it had uh, water in already. Um, it had the conduit for power. We had just had to run the line, um, and so. I guess, you know, last year in March when COVID was really starting to ramp up and everybody was talking lockdowns and all this craziness, um, I mean, we were in no position to buy property. I mean, we, <laughs> we had a house in Cornelius, but um, it, what, we didn't have any money to like throw down on a down payment or any like, so we decided like, we knew that the USDA had this program. I, I've been talking to the USDA on and off for like three, three or, four, year, years, three or yeah. four years trying to figure out how I could qualify. And we went to uh, the Farmer Veteran Coalition Conference in Austin, and they had a bunch of USDA people there. I picked their brain the entire time to figure out how I can qualify and all this. And so when, when the COVID hit, we, we went out to Fern Hill and had some wine and was like, it's going to get crazy. This year is going to get real crazy, you know, and we, we should just throw a Hail Mary on this property and try to lock it up. Uh, contingent on USDA financing. Mm -hmm. So we put in an offer, we were bumpable right away, but um, so we, we, we put in that offer and then we started talking to the USDA out of Salem there and um, started putting together the application that we needed, paperwork and everything like that. Once we got it all in, we, got, we were able to lock this into pending and then go back and forth with the USDA. We actually at first were denied um, and we had to go and appeal and fight in front of a panel uh, to, to prove our point, you know, to, to prove that we were able to do this. Yeah, I'm know, serious about I'm it. Serious about it. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they wanted, I mean, I, I thought at first it was going to be coming down to my experience and like whether or not I'd be approved based on my viticulture experience, but that they didn't even seem to care about that. They wanted to see the budget. They wanted to see how Makes many sense. tons you're going to throw <laughs> and, and will it pay for this problem. Yeah. And they, they completely discounted Dauntless Wine as an income factor. And so we had to be really creative with the USDA and saying, hey, this is this is how we can make it work, you know. Um, and f thankfully, when we went down to Salem and spoke in front of this panel, the, 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 the head honcho there was an army vet. And it just, uh, I, I don't know if it saved us. But, yeah, I don't uh, know if it, that mattered or yeah, not. I don't but... know if it mattered or not, but I mean, we had a pretty valid argument, but um, it just, you know, it probably helped a little bit. And so... Um, yeah, we, we, we sold our house that, uh, let's see, we secured this in September or October? So, yeah, end of September, and I think. We, we put our house up, you know, sold with, by the second walkthrough, and we, we did a contingent, or um, what was it? Uh, we we, we could, rented we, back rent for a few back months. For we, we were hoping we could rent back through April to miss the snow, 
but we had to move out in we February. Out in February and then <laughs> got hit with that major ice storm and so that was a learning experience in and of itself. But um, lived on a generator for two months, which was an interesting experience as well. But it was like the world was asking how much we wanted it and we said this much. And so, so far so good. Um, we've now that we've actually had, well, this was all overgrown when we bought it, you know, so we couldn't see the topography really, you know, we, we could see it on a map and it's not, it's like, okay, yeah, that looks, doesn't tight. look it too does, bad. It, that's manageable, <laughs> sure. And then we get it mowed and it's just like, wow, that's, that's actually steep at some point. So, um, there, there, there have been some, I wouldn't say hidden, um, surprises, but, uh, maybe more drastic than we had anticipated. So where we've, We've changed our plan on this site probably a hundred times already. I mean, it, like every day, I feel like some, something, something changes. changes. So, um, if all goes according to plan, we'll be planting next spring. Well, our first block, at least. You know, we, there'll probably be um, two or three years of planting to kind of because we know we're going to have to, for safe tractor operation, smooth out some areas. Okay. So, okay. Um, but we're we're excited to be here. This is this is great. Um, we I've already met. The owners of that vineyard across the way there, um, Glenn Watts, I think his name is the owner. He's the on the board of the Shehalem Wine Growers Association. And um, there's another grape grower up around the corner here that has introduced himself via email. But um, I'm going to go talk to him hopefully this week too. And so um, that camaraderie is almost instant. You know, like I don't know how the word got out, but all of a sudden, you know, just people <laughs> are just talking to us about about the property. And so. Um, yeah, it's been good so far. And we're really excited about this opportunity, for sure. So planting grapes next spring, spring yeah. 2022. Yeah. And what about behind the me here? What's, what's going to happen behind us? So yeah, that's where our winery is going to be. Um, we're going all steel construction. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a lean-to on the front there, like a roof, uh, shed-style roof. And that will be built out like a, a storefront for like a tasting room, but mm -hmm. it will be our apartment to start. Um, we already have, fortunately, a tasting room in Forest Grove where people go. Um, and we're planning to keep that. And we're planning to keep yeah. that because it's our residence as well. So we don't want a lot of people up here, you know, we'll, we'll maybe club and appointment only sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, that's that's the first thing we want to really get knocked out. I, I, it's probably too tight of a timeline to get it done by this crush. Um, but hopefully it'll be done by winter and then we'll be able to start moving our wine up here. Um, incrementally and move into it and move into it <laughs> i mean the fifth wheel is nice but um, i don't want to go through another winter yeah, in the fifth wheel yeah, if we don't have to if we don't have to yeah. but we'll survive yeah. <laughs> so a lot of excavation still needs to get done um well we actually are working now with a we change contractors and we're, we're working now with a club member who's a contractor that does a lot of habitat restoration. He has a really interesting excavator that is like a spider and has like these forearms and so he can go up and down our slope all day long, no problem. Um, and we also have a spring on site so we want to kind of, I mean a big, I, I'm, I, I have a heart for nature and I, I want to, as a, as a landowner, I, you know, I feel like it's our responsibility to be a steward to nature as well and so I want to Kind of en enhance that spring make a little bit of a riparian zone and really try to make a i mean i'll take some of the concepts from permaculture that i've learned and apply it but i won't be a hundred percent like permaculture or biodynamic I, I like to pick and choose you know i like to be on my own kind of program i suppose practice organic as much as possible yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah exactly you mentioned that you have a pretty small case production at the moment, a surprisingly small case production in some ways. Yeah. With the growth of this, do you, do you anticipate that changing? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, we've already got some um, contracts lined up for more um, grapes this year. Um, we're hoping to maybe hit, I actually applied with the USDA for a value added producer grant. I'm hoping to hear back by the end of this month whether or not that will go through or not, but I'm hoping to get up to the 30 ton mark maybe this year. Um, but we'll see, you know, uh, ideally we want to be at 2,000 to 5,000 case production. Uh, the most we've ever produced is about, I would say 1,300 cases in one vintage. Um, but yeah, the, the 5,000, I think we'll kind of cap it at 5,000. Uh, I don't want to lose sight of the wine, you know, and I, we're not looking for international or national distribution. We're not looking to be a huge, huge brand. We want to keep the quality high. Um, keep the wine club tight, just have a really well, just well created.
well-greased machine, well-oiled machine, you know, so, um, yeah, we, we definitely want to, we're building out about a 2,400 square foot space, and I think I could get upwards of 5,000 cases out of it, we'll see, <laughs> might have to, Get creative. Get, get creative. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I talk now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and he dreams big too. I so. do. I, I dream a little too big sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're definitely wanting to expand production for sure. So we already talked a bit about about the 2020 for you guys. A little yeah. different than a lot of the stories we've heard. Of course, you you you, I mean, you took advantage, took a chance. I I'm curious. Beyond that, uh, effects from from COVID on, on your work and on on your lives last mm -hmm. year. How, how did the pandemic affect you, other than what we've talked about already? I mean, uh, it affected us pretty much like it affected everybody else, I suppose. You know, the um, in March we were shut down, just like mm -hmm. you know all yep, the other fully shut down. every other almost commercial business. And fortunately, we do our two club releases here in the spring and in the fall. We kind of bookend the off season and. Um, we were just ramping up into our club release when things were going, you know, kind of south for everybody. We were expecting, you know, a dropout rate to kind of match the new unemployment rate, but all but maybe two wine club members stepped in or uh, so fell out, and then one wine club, member, wine club member stepped in and donated a case to give out to anybody that couldn't make their payment, you know, and to keep other club members in which was phenomenal yeah we 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 kept like 99 percent of our club and then they ordered more you know and so um and then we went out and delivered you know we we pivoted like we had to um we, we just started making deliveries for two months straight and we actually posted growth in 2020 it was, it was an incredible thing like yeah we, i mean after the club release we just started hitting the farmer's markets like nobody's business you know mm -hmm. and so um, then once the tasting room was back open for, you know, bottle sales, you know, we, we, we did that obviously, but, um, yeah, we, we, we pivoted the way we needed to, to make things work. And, um, it, it was actually not too bad. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a lot of hard work and it was scary. Of, I mean, scary. It was... we didn't know what was going to happen and we had to hustle, you know, yeah. we had to hustle really hard. Um, and then we, we got this at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. we, we went through a lot in 2020 and we're like, okay, you know, 21's going to kind of smooth out and calm down a little bit. And now 21's like almost like <laughs> even crazier than 20 is. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't know if it is or not. We'll, we'll see, but it's shaping up to be that kind of yeah. intense, I suppose. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the Forest Grove itself, I mean, we have amazing club members, but we also have, you know, that community in Forest Grove of... You know, as soon as we were able to reopen, whether it was for serving or just for to-go purchases, people came and supported. I mean, mm -hmm. that, uh, the, I feel like people in Forest Grove want their community to succeed. They want all these newer businesses to stay open, restaurants, um, tasting rooms, things like that. And so, yeah, we're just really fortunate that there's a lot of great people around us that yeah. wanted to make sure that we didn't close. Yeah, so. no, it was, it was the, the community kind of just rallied. Um, and it was, it was great to see. It was really kind of humbling, too. You know, mm -hmm. we, we didn't know what to expect, um, but we were able to make all of our payments on everything, and we didn't miss a beat, almost. I mean, we missed having people in our tasting room, obviously. Um, and there are definitely months that were much slower than they would have been. You know, like, summertime's yeah. usually a great time for, for wine. But, um, yeah, like you said, we did as many farmer's markets as we could. And even some of those we, we couldn't pour at, but people was, were still attending, and they wanted to just help out. So they would just buy a bottle anyway, even if they couldn't taste it and didn't know if they would like it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, 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 just made it work. Well, it, it was... It was, I mean, it was an interesting year, to say the least. You know, the, the fires yeah. didn't really help anything. Yeah. Um, but it was interesting of being up here this far north. We, I remember we were driving south to go to Laurel Ridge and Yamhill Carlton, and basically where we're at now, yeah. there was, was right probably here. this this wall of smoke coming up, and it just kind of stopped right here because we had this big northerly gust that was kind of rolling back the smoke. And so the north end of the valley here early on was spared you know then we had the bald peak fire and all these other fires kind of happen and so it kind of got a little hazy but um we had time to kind of prepare for it we saw it coming from the south mm -hmm. you know the smoke coming from the south so we were able to um pivot around that as well and i'm that we um, just released our 2020 rosé and gris 
both are tasting phenomenal. We were actually able to get the grease off the vine before the smoke rolled in. And so it came in at a lower sugar and now lower alcohol, but it's much more delicate, you know, a lot more floral aromas, really, really a nice Pinot Gris. So, yeah. um, and the, the rosé is tasting really nice as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, 2020 was, you know, it tested our metal, but <laughs> um, nothing we couldn't handle, I don't think, for sure. <laughs> So we talked earlier about kind of your initial impressions of, of Oregon wine. I'm curious, um, what are the changes you've seen in Oregon wine, either as an observer of it or now a, a participant in it? Uh, what does it look like now compared to what your initial impressions were? I mean, I'm still so young in the industry that I don't know if I have <laughs> any place to make comments on it, <laughs> given, you know, a lot of people have been in it for much longer than I have. Um, I mean, when we were getting in, in 2014, 2015, that's when kind of Jackson family was coming up at the same time. And not to say anything bad about Jackson family, but that, you know, that I would say was kind of the most evident change that was happening is this kind of changing of the guard where all these families that have existed in Oregon wine for a really long time, um, you know, maybe the kids didn't want to take it over or what have you. Um, we saw, you know, a lot of big companies coming up here and kind of um, consolidating a lot of these previously family-owned wineries and vineyards and so I would say that was probably the, the the starkest change that I've that I've noticed since I've been up here or been up here been in wine um, other than that I don't know I mean I, I can't I, I mean can't I think. feel like there's a lot of new a lot of new, new boutiques mm -hmm. wineries you know I feel like yeah. there, there's definitely a boutique scene kind of really um, coming up right mm -hmm. now um, and and craft wine is becoming much more a thing and then obviously canned wine and seltzers and all of that stuff i mean yeah that, that's that's definitely a craze right now and we've actually kind of looked into that but have decided against it but um yeah and you know the the yeah and then the low alcohol trend too you know like on the consumer side of things uh there's been this kind of movement towards i mean even no alcohol wines it's like uh, fermentation, like, you can, uh, wine is not a wine without the alcohol. Like, I mean, that that is the byproduct of the fermentation. It's like taking the curd out of cheese. I mean, it's like, how, how does how do you even call it, call it that? I, I don't I don't even know. Um, but yeah, that that's probably the two biggest things that I've noticed. And what do you see as you look ahead for the industry? For e either of you, what do you what do you see mm -hmm. ahead in Oregon wine? I mean, the continued premiumization, um, uh, maintaining quality product across the board, North and South Valley, you know, and Umqua and all that. Uh, Milton Freewater, I feel like, is really up and coming. I'm really excited about what they're doing in, the, uh, in that area. Um, I feel like there might be a pivot away from Pinot, you know, as people try to stand out. I mean, we're, we're fortunate enough that um, we have a good story, a good mission, a good brand. Um, all of our bottles have a little bit of history on the label. Um, so we kind of stand out naturally in that regard. But, you know, it's hard for, uh, if you don't have a story in the brand, um, how are you going to differentiate? You know, Oregon Pinot is um, a unique thing and it's very expressive wine. Um, but yeah it's like how do you stand out on the shelf into the consumer eyes and so other varietals i feel like might be the kind of pivot point for others whether they're sourcing it from other areas or we see more plantings of different reds more gamay maybe the Beaujolais craze um it's hard to say really i you know i don't have a fortune <laughs> I, mean, I can't tell the future or whatever but yeah yeah i i don't know i mean do you have any thoughts on that no no, never think, I agree with what you said. You have that camera back there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I did say that out loud. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, know, that's I can't deny it. <laughs> Is there anything as you look ahead that you're concerned about? Anything you're, anything you're fearful of in Oregon wine? Um, I mean, I would kind of side with Ken Wright in the regard that you know, big business might come up here and do just a bunch of Valley Floor pl 
plantings doing like 10 acres a ton, 14 acres a ton sort of, and then just make bulk, bulk Pinot, you know, and then um, dilute the average bottle price down or the quality or even the, br the brand of Willamette Valley, you know. Uh, so uh, I would say that would probably, probably be my biggest concern. Um, I mean, we'll see it happen in real time as these you know, plantings happen, if they do happen. Um, and I would say broadly, I might be in support of his initiative to categorize the Willamette Valley based on slope and elevation. Um, and I think that is a, a good concept to talk about, um, or a good initiative to talk about. Mm. Um, because, you know, the, the founders of Oregon wine focused on quality. They, they came up here with Pinot Noir and wanted to make, you know, uh, a really craft product based on terroir and place. And so um, I, I, I don't want to see that get diluted. You know, I, I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of Oregon wine and that quality aspect is pivotal to all of it. So we've already talked a little bit about, the, about your kind of future plans for, for the brand and for the space. Uh, is there anything else uh, for the future for the two of you that you're looking forward to? Oh man, every day. <laughs> <laughs> like something um, I mean, just getting the winery up with yeah. the for us. Um, and getting this, you know, the vineyard planted. Getting the vineyard planted. Um, just kind of seeing how this setting evolves, I think, yeah. will be, it'll be fun to watch. I mean, even just in the last few months, not a lot has been done yet, but it's changed drastically from when we purchased it. So um, I think for me, especially like just having, seeing the progress of all of that and how it evolves and, and what kind of wine he ends up making yeah. out of these grapes that we yeah. start growing ourselves. Yeah. I think, you know, when we have our first harvest, maybe four or five years from now, um, it'll be interesting to see how those grapes, when what they become wine-wise, um, and how they differ from what I source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if there'll be much of a difference, if any at all. You know, yeah. especially um, getting grapes from other parts of the Shehalem here, or now the Laurelwood district. Um, and then getting grapes from other vineyards. Um, I'm excited to see well, I've already been in contact with other veteran vineyard owners um, in Washington and kind of Eastern Oregon and sourcing, you know, some, some bigger reds. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking about other varietals. I'm already, I'm, you know, looking at that too. I've already made a Syrah, um, looking at Cab Franc and Merlot now. Um, and so that, that'll be fun just mm -hmm. to see how my big reds might differ from others mm -hmm. or if they'll be the same. I don't, I don't know. But... Um, and then the nonprofit too. The nonprofit is a good group of people that it's like I wish I could hire all of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. uh, There's just a really solid crew, really solid team, with a lot of good experience. Mm -hmm. and so, um, I'm I'm excited to see this thing evolve beyond me. You know, for the last six years, it's been mostly my initiative and push and drive. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to it not being that as much <laughs> because, it, you know, have some time off, I guess, would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> One day here and there would be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a day off would be nice. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess that's what we pay for being so tenacious as, as we are. Um, yeah. Yeah, you don't get a lot of vacation days out of that. Mm -hmm. No. no not <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the future is bright. And, um, other... I guess any other concerns? I don't know. I mean, climate change is always a topic of conversation, but you know, I I, I, I don't know how that's going to pan out. Uh, you know, vines kind of do well when they struggle. You know, when there's not as much water. So, um, will viticulture be impacted as much? That's uh, we'll we'll see. But it might not, as compared to maybe some, you know, corn or soybeans or something like that. So, we're in the right commodity, I suppose. But, um, yeah, the future is bright. We're excited for it. Mm -hmm. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to, to enter the Oregon wine industry? Um, it depends on what they want to do, but go to Chemeketa, I would say. Again, <laughs> yeah, you know, Chemeketa, start there. Start there if you want to get into production or grape growing. Um, and then, you know, I was fortunate enough to be able to volunteer to kind of get my feet wet. And if you have the time and ability to volunteer at a winery to get in on the ground floor, do that. Um, 
it's going to be hard work. You know, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta want it. You gotta want it really bad. Um, and it's it's really a lifestyle, you know. It really is a lifestyle, um, and that's what I remember early on. Uh, Cortell always told us it's it's a lifestyle, and so um, I, that that was fine with me. You know, I, I'm not in this to obviously you know make any money or anything. I, I really just <laughs> enjoy being yeah. able to be in the vines. I mean, the vines kind of talk to you after a while when you when you're working with them. They it's a very interesting interesting relationship between vines and humans I suppose but um, yeah it's um, I don't know I, I would say just um, be prepared for a lot of long hours as it is <laughs> have a supportive partner have a supportive <laughs> yeah. partner yeah, exactly um, because there's a lot of opportunity in, in wine you know it's one thing that actually early on kind of drew me to it was that it was the out of most commodities and agricultural crops is the most vertically integrated. I mean, people go to the vineyard and expect to taste the product grown on that site. You don't do that with like blueberry farms really, or strawberry farms or wheat or corn or anything like that. So the that means the whole supply chain is more or less kind of siloed together. And so if you don't want to do winemaking, that's great. There's, like I said, logistics, sales, uh, marketing, advertising. I mean, there's there's so many things you can do in the wine industry, and it is a really ver versatile industry to be a part of. Um, so there are a lot of options, you know. And then all the kind of auxiliary roles that kind of fill fill in those n niche uh, needs are big too. So there's a lot you can do. You know, there's a lot. You can do. Well, that's all the questions that I have for the two of you today. Looks like we're about to get rained on. <laughs> no, it's, it's been, been a, great a wild day. Yeah, yep. All of the weather. Yeah. Exactly. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? Uh, I know one thing you you did ask him earlier. What um, you know, like what varietals of wine is you know, like you didn't answer the question about you're making Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, oh, Pinot yeah. Gris, Rosé. I get lost in my own story. Yeah, I mean that was the only thing I did. Um, I noticed you didn't ever answer, but I mean it's pretty yeah. obvious you're making I, Pinot Noir. But I like to focus um, on single clone stuff. Yeah, I, I, I really do like you know clones by themselves. I feel like they're all unique and kind of distinct in their own way. We've done a Pomard, um, a lot of different Vadensville vintages, a Triple Seven now. Uh, a 113, you know, 113 is something that I've never worked with before until 2018, and um, that's kind of more of a, a grippy Pinot. It's really interesting, um, but it, it, it is a little bit bigger, and I'm, I'm excited to release that. We're still sitting on it right now, but maybe later this year in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, Pinot Noir, obviously, we do a Syrah, Chardonnay, Gris, Rosé. Um, I've done a Blanc Noir, which was a phenomenal hit. Um, and then the, our, our first white blend was a co-fermentation of Pinot Gris, 70% Pinot Gris, 30% Blanc Noir, and with a little bit of oak on the end there, and that has been proven very popular. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to do, you know, bigger reds as well. I'm actually thinking about maybe planting some Syrah here. You know, I feel like Syrah has a wide range that it can grow in. It can, it can ripen in these kind of cooler environments, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it also could be our canary in the cage for, you know, climate change. If it really does start to ramp up, um, we'll be able to see it in the Syrah, really. And if it doesn't ripen, we'll just put it into the Pinot or make a rosé out of it. And, you know, there's a lot of different options. Um, but yeah, yeah, I guess that would be it. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for thank your time you. today, for uh, your stories, for your hospitality, this beautiful place, yeah. and uh, let you off the hook. All right, awesome, thank, thank you. you.